Well, so like right now, the frame rate at which the brain kind of like refreshes um, what it perceives as continuous motion in our visual field and how that affects our perception of time, that's something I'm thinking about a lot. I'm so in love. Hey, Hodinky, is there a quote, right way to wear a NATO strap? I'm going to be honest, I have literally never been able to find a NATO strap that I'm comfortable with. Maybe it's like the size of my wrist, but they always seem to be either too long or too short. There's like a little dangly bit that hangs off uh, or needs to be tucked under and it never stays tucked under when I want it to stay tucked under. Certainly not the case for everybody. My colleague James Stacy, for instance, has uh, written about how you can modify a NATO so that you don't have to monkey around with tuck unders or fold overs. And this involves uh, cutting the strap and then basically cauterizing the end so that it doesn't unravel. It works, but it feels like a workaround to me and like not a very aesthetically satisfying one. And like, I'm not as much of a perfectionist in large things as I should be. And I overcompensate by being a perfectionist in small things. So rather than, for instance, having a sense of fiscal responsibility that would allow me to uh, become independently wealthy in a reasonable time span, I uh, find NATO straps objectionable instead, um, which is not like, not really the way to lead a well-balanced life, but uh, you know, it's maybe a way to be a watch writer. But like, I want the strap when I get it to fit perfectly. So like, I generally don't wear them. Now, the question was not, does Jack Forster like NATO straps? The question was, is there a right way and a wrong way to wear a NATO strap? And the answer is, there isn't a right way or a wrong way. There's a way that is most comfortable for you. One of the most famous wear case scenarios for NATO straps is probably James Bond wearing one in Dr. No, and that like the strap is too small for the lugs and you can see the spring bars. And uh, if you post a picture, of a watch on a NATO strap with that kind of a gap uh, that's you know too small or too big. On Instagram nowadays, people would be all over you, but one of the things about NATOs that makes them fun if you like them is they really should come with a certain amount of I don't give a crap what other people think how this looks. In a constantly surveilled Instagrammed watch world, not giving two bits what somebody else thinks and making it apparent in your choice of an ill-fitting NATO strap is kind of fun. What are the different types of shock protection and how do they work? Shock protection is actually a little bit older than most people might suspect. And as usual, um, Abraham Louis Breguet was uh, one of the people who was there first. So why do we need shock protection at all? Well, the part of the watch that needs shock protection the most is actually the balance. And historically, you made balances as heavy as you, as you could within reason and as large a diameter as you could within reason, because then you would have a greater moment of inertia and you would have greater frequency stability. You also don't want such a balance to be running in large pivots because this introduces friction. Friction is the enemy of harmonic oscillation. Uh, you have what's called an overdamped oscillator. So what you end up with is the largest, heaviest balance that you can practically have running on extremely thin, delicate pivots. And uh, if you take a high grade vintage pocket watch, for instance, with a, a bimetallic temperature compensating balance, you drop it three inches onto a hardwood table and you're probably gonna bend the balance staff. Modern shock protection systems started to come out in the 1930s and sort of like the classic version is uh, the Inca block system. And the Inca block system or some variation thereof is found in you know, virtually all modern watches. So the way that this works is the two pivots of the balance staff um, you know, one on either side of the balance, they sit in uh, four jewels. There's a bearing jewel in which the pivot actually runs and there's a cap jewel. And these two jewels on both sides are mounted in specially formed springs that allow the jewels to actually displace laterally and vertically if there's a shock to the watch, but which under normal circumstances hold the balance firmly enough in position that it can interact very, very precisely with the escapement. That's basically how all modern shock protection systems work um, with, you know, again, with basic variations on a theme. And uh, without them, it's very, very likely that uh, wristwatches would have remained a somewhat niche affectation rather than high precision instruments that are ready to go out in the world and uh, take a licking and keep on ticking. Hey Hodinky, why can't the seconds hand on a quartz watch smoothly sweep like the seconds hand on a mechanical watch? So this question kind of cuts to the core, the, the fundamental core of how a quartz watch actually works. We pretty much all know that a mechanical watch has a balance in it that goes back and forth tick, 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 a certain number of times per second. And essentially, all a watch is is a machine that counts the number of ticks and advances the seconds hand uh, according to the number of ticks it takes to occupy an entire second's time. Quartz watches also have a mechanical oscillator inside them. However, it is not a balance wheel. It is a quartz tuning fork. And you run electricity through it at the right voltage with the right configuration of the tuning fork, 
the tuning fork will vibrate at 32 kilohertz. That's 32,000 times per second, approximately. And what you have is you have an integrated circuit that counts the number of times that the tuning fork oscillates. And when it adds up to the number of oscillations that you need to occupy one second, something called a stepper motor advances the hands one increment, you know, which is one second. Now, you can have quartz watches that run at a higher frequency and that have what look like smoother sweeping seconds hands. So uh, Bulova, for instance, has a movement called the Precisionist, where the, uh, the quartz oscillator vibrates many, many times faster than in a conventional quartz watch. And it looks, when you look at it, as if the seconds hand is advancing smoothly, but it's not actually advancing smoothly. It's advancing 16 times per second. But there is no watch that has a smoothly sweeping seconds hand, either mechanical or quartz, except for Seiko's spring drive. So the way the spring drive works, you have an electric generator and you have a small flywheel with a magnetic brake applying a magnetic braking force to it, but the flywheel is not uh, oscillating. It is moving smoothly. And uh, that's the only watch that I can think of off the top of my head or even you know, halfway down towards the bottom of my head that has a, a seconds hand that uh, actually adv truly advances smoothly without any increments. Hey Hodinkee, I'm looking to buy a watch as a parting gift for my boss. He's a serious collector and I have $5,000 to spend. Any suggestions? This is a little bit of a difficult question to answer just because of the way it's framed. A serious collector can mean a lot of things. It can mean somebody with um, a lot of money who seriously collects Langenzona. It can mean somebody with a high net worth individual who seriously collects vintage Patek Philippe perpetual calendar chronographs. But to me, serious collector conveys somebody uh, who loves uh, seeing minutely attended to details in a watch add up to something uh, unified and harmoniously beautiful. And uh, that has to kind of include the whole package. So it includes a movement that's thoughtfully executed, uh, both from a design and, you know, within the context of the price range, uh, design and aesthetics and finish as well. Uh, it means a beautifully designed and polished case. It probably means simplicity over complexity because uh, it's much easier to produce a simple, beautiful watch at 5,000 and under than it is to produce a complicated watch at 5,000 and under. You know, there are, there are a number of brands that are potential candidates. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm a huge Grand Seiko fanboy and uh, have been for many years. And I think that if you want something really beautifully and thoughtfully executed and uh, something that really expresses the most essential aspect of what it is that makes a watch interesting to somebody who's interested in watches, Grand Seiko is like good bread and butter. It's very hard to beat. So you want to talk about the specifics about what makes uh, Grand Seiko, I think, you know, to this day, a great value at that price point. They have very, very elegant, beautifully designed dials, really, really smart use of color. Uh, the cases are beautifully designed and polished. Uh, the dial furniture is absolutely exquisite. And uh, you take all those things together, plus what's really kind of an astonishing price point for a watch of that high quality, and uh, it's, it's, it's a bit irresistible. I think another company that's really worth looking at in terms of offering a tremendous amount of bang for the buck is uh, Tudor. And the fact that Tudor makes really interesting watches with uh, really robust, um, uh, really well-engineered movements, interesting cases and interesting dial designs, it's pretty well known. One of my favorite uh, recently introduced Tudor watches is the Tudor FXD, and it's a, a little bit of a divisive watch because it doesn't really toe the line in terms of what people expect from a classic dive watch design, but having had a chance to wear one for an extended period of time, it's kind of a knockout. It's really, really comfortable to wear. I would start out looking at those, uh, looking at Grand Seiko in general at that price point and looking at uh, Tudor, the FXD in particular, uh, if you're looking for something that's, um, you know, really kind of just a super sturdy, go anywhere, do anything field watch. All right, my friends, it has been uh, absolutely wonderful answering your questions, uh, hearing what you think, and uh, hopefully shedding a little light on some interesting corners of watchmaking and watch design. Uh, please do keep those questions coming because as I always say, uh, without you, we can't do the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe.